Today's lesson, I will tell you about the Arctic, seen as the people's land, so about how do people live there, what do they do in the Arctic. And as a warm-up exercise, there is uh, the first task on the handouts that you have been given. There is a list of geographical names of places, and please mark these of those places who, according to your knowledge or your intuition, are located in the Arctic. During the lesson, you will, yes, you will have a chance to confirm if you are correct or not. Let us do this for, wait for two minutes for you to, to do this exercise, and then we will go on with the proper lesson. Okay, fine. I think you have already finished um, marking the Arctic places. So let's start with with lesson. That compared to the whole world, Arctic is just eight percent of the Earth's surface, but only half per mil of the whole planet's population live in the Arctic. So it means it is a really vast and really sparsely populated land. And we know it is in the north, we, we can say it, but what is the exact definition? How do we know, uh, how, do we know um, whether, how do we know where exactly is uh, the Arctic? And now I will introduce you to uh, the uh, to the various ideas that are given to that are proposed as the borders of the Arctic. So the first one that may seem most intuitive for us is the Arctic Circle. It is, uh, in a way, an astronomical border because it is the latitude uh, north of which, for some part of the winter, the sun never rises above the horizon, and for some part of the summer, the sun never sets below the horizon. It is a very elegant, so to say, border. It cleanly cuts off the northern tip of the planet as the Arctic. But it is uh, not actually realistic. It doesn't fit the Arctic realities and a lot of uh, spaces of places which are, which we, even we would consider to be in the Arctic are actually excluded with this kind of border, both in, in uh, both in the natural and the cultural uh, way of thinking about the Arctic. So let's move to the second proposition, that is the northern tree line. The northern, the northern tree line is the, the line that was the border of the Arctic that is proposed by naturalists, by people who study botanics and ecosystems. Uh, the green line on the map you can see here, it is uh, the northern tree line that is the line and north of which no trees can grow. It is either too cold, maybe too windy, maybe too dry for trees to grow north of this line, and it is proposed to be a border of the Arctic. As you can see, it excludes even more land than the Arctic Circle. For example, almost the whole of northern Scandinavia is out of the Arctic under, these, uh, under this um, border under this delimitation and its other drawback is that it is ambiguous it is really hard to uh, just draw a line uh, connecting uh, the northernmost trees in Siberia in, in Scandinavia or in Canada so it is sometimes uh, approximated this natural border of the Arctic with the climatological data, that is the every isotherm of average temperature of July of 10 degrees. So in this interpretation, the Arctic would be the area uh, in which the average temperature in July is never higher than 10 degrees centigrade, which is, of course, also an approximation because the climatological data are extrapolated from sparsely uh, set up meteorological station. So the third pro suggestion, proposal I have for you for 
uh, delimiting the Arctic are the realistic borders, so to say. And these are drawn by uh, organizations, agencies, who are uh, devoted to monitoring studying of the Arctic. It is either organizations that look at the social aspects of life in the Arctic, or the ones who take care of the Arctic environment. And they have drawn the lines, which we can see here. They do differ in places. They, there are some uh, discrepancies between them. But as you can see, they do not uh, fit exactly the Arctic Circle, nor the Northern Tree Line. And these are what we could say all uh, realistic borders of the Arctic, which take into account the uh, cultural and societal conditions, such as what people do live in this area, what are the livelihoods, what what is their economy, as well as environmental uh, conditions, such as the landscape uh, character, the, the landscape of tundra taiga or or uh, ice. And now, uh, having said that, let us um, think about this for a little bit, about those borders, please. Let us again give us ourselves two minutes for, uh, for thinking and tell me in the chat what of these borders, the three uh, kinds of borders I have told you about, which of them do you think is the best and like which one of them do you like the most? Okay, well, I think we can move on to the next topic of today's class. That is the people of the Arctic. Who actually lives in the Arctic? We will start with the indigenous peoples. These are the peoples, the nations, that have lived in the Arctic for generations, almost since forever, so to say, since the Arctic became habitable. On this slide, which I'm presenting to you now, you can see three examples of those peoples, although there are a lot of nations inhabiting the Arctic. Uh, first are the Saha, who are living in Siberia. They are one, one of many Siberian nations, such as Komi or, or Samoyed. The other one, the one in colorful clothing, are Sami. They are living in Lapland, in the north of Scandinavia, in Sweden, Finland, and Norway, as well as partially in Russia. And they are sometimes considered Indians of Europe, so to say. The, the last uh, people, the last nation that has lived here, for, so to say, forever, since, since the time immemorial. And the third one in the bottom are the Inuit. They inhabit the North America, the North American Arctic, that is Canada and Alaska and Greenland. The images you see here, uh, they all depict those peoples in traditional clothing. Uh, although they very often dress modernly because of the progress of technology and society has of course uh, touched on them as well, these clothing, especially the winter clothing, is sometimes still in use because it is just practical and useful for hard Arctic winters. The indigenous peoples, for, for, for most of their history of contact with the Europeans and Americans, had a rather tough time, so to say. They were treated really badly by people who were colonizing the Americas or by uh, the Scandinavian nations who were pushing up north. Uh, a lot their cultures uh, were, were very often um, eradicated. There were attempts of eradication of their culture, of forced conversions to Christianity or burning of, of their cultural heritage. It, it was really, uh, they were treated really, really badly throughout the history. But this, uh, is, uh, this is changing nowadays. This is changing. The countries that are in the Arctic have recognized them as, as citizens and uh, now the, they integrate with, with the modern societies on increasingly good conditions. For example, the examples you can see here is that below, in the picture below, you can see a Sami parliament. Each of the Nordic nations, Sweden, Finland and, uh, and Norway, had such institutions as Sami parliament. Their purpose is to allow Sami to organize, to self self-govern to an extent, 
to, to be represented in the politics of the country they live in. It is something that has actually popped up only in the 20th century, but it is working out, working out great. And the other example you can see on the other picture, there is a person of the Inuit nation who is using a snowmobile. And that's another um, aspect in which the modern world is getting, creeping into the lives of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. They are adopting a lot of um, European, Western technology, customs for themselves, but without forsaking the culture. And uh, very often they do and keep the old traditions alive because the indigenous peoples of the Arctic have very old and rich cultures, which to this day and use scientists both with their um, sophistication and as well as their great knowledge of the Arctic, of its nature, of its uh, everything, the ways of the Arctic, which can even help modern researchers who are doing fieldwork in the Arctic with their work. And I have mentioned the countries in the Arctic throughout the history were not really nice to people up there in the north. And nowadays, the countries of the Arctic are, as you can see on the map, it is, the countries of the Arctic, the Arctic countries, are all whose, uh, whose at least a part of their territory is located in the Arctic. You can see it uh, in Asia, it's Russia exclusively. In Europe, it's Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and Iceland, uh, and Denmark, because of its possession of Greenland, which is currently located in the Arctic. And in the North America, we've got Canada, and the UN, United States of America, because of the state of Alaska, which is also a part of the Arctic. Of these countries, only Iceland is located fully in the Arctic. For all other countries, the Arctic is a distant, a distant region, somewhat provincial, quite far away from main hubs of population or main hubs of commerce. Uh, so, so they are often, in a way, neglected as, as the backwater part of the country. Nevertheless, it is, these are vast areas, huge, huge tracts of land, which are full of natural resources. That's why they are getting more and more attention as with, with the changing climate, the Arctic is becoming more and more accessible. So it's easier and easier to go up there to the north and extract some valuable resources. And if we have mentioned resources, let's say a bit about the Arctic economy. So what is it that um, gives Arctic money. And it is first and foremost the industry. There are four major kinds of industry or extraction, so to say, that are done in the Arctic. These are uh, mineral extraction, such as on this uh, picture you can see the Akati diamond mine. It's a great, great, huge uh, facility that just extracts the diamonds from, from the ground. You can see it is really, really big. And because Arctic is so vast a land, it was possible to build such a huge facility up there in the north. It shouldn't be possible, for example, in Poland or close to Toronto. The other thing is uh, oil and gas extraction. And here you can say the see example of a Russian oil rig located in, the, in one of the seas around the Arctic Ocean which is extracting oil and gas from the bottom of the ocean. But we cannot also forget that on land in the Arctic, there is also a great many of, great lot of oil and gas, which is extracted. So a lot of the oil and Russian oil, Russian gas, you, we are hearing about in the news, actually comes from the Arctic area, from the parts of Siberia, or that's what sometimes the Russian Arctic is called, uh, that are located up high up in the north. The other industries are uh, fisher, fishing, fishery, uh, which is done mainly by Nordic nations as well as Canada, and forestry, that for ages was a pillar of Finnish economy, the best Finnish forests were uh, harvested for wood, for paper, and still are. But aside of these uh, kinds of resource 
extracting economy, there are of course services in the Arctic. People live there, people have to, to do things and one of the um, things we don't really think about when we think about the economy of the Arctic is its cold temperatures. And this has been turned to an economic advantage by Sweden and Iceland as well as I have heard. I have heard. Uh, on the picture here you can see a huge hall, industrial hall, which looks like a big factory, but actually it is not. It is a data center. It is a building which houses a great, great many of servers or computers which are working for Facebook. Our pictures are stored there, all the algorithms of Facebook are running in relation to this data center. And it is located there in northern Sweden, quite far away from, so to say, civilization, from big cities with engineers, because it is cold there. Those uh, facilities, those uh, computer server installations, generate a lot, a lot of heat. And it is way easier to cool them in the Arctic, where it is cold naturally, than it is, for example, in the US, where you would need um, specific dedicated uh, devices to cool down such a great machinery. And the other big branch of Arctic services is, sorry for that, is tourism. The great example of tourist boom, it is a great boom in the Arctic right now, and Iceland is the greatest example of that. Here on the picture you can see how many tourists are coming to a gazer on Iceland. Uh, the Arctic is getting more and more accessible, as I have mentioned, because of climate change, because of melting ice, as well as because it became trendy, so the flights are cheaper. And a lot of people want to go there to see the Arctic landscapes, which are marketed, and rightly so, as unspoiled by human activity, pristine nature that can be enjoyed in calm and silence. But this actually is becoming less and less true because the Iceland, which you can see on the picture, it is a country of 320,000 people. And in the last year, there were almost 2 million tourists who have visited the place. So it is six times as many tourists as inhabitants. And the Icelanders, despite tourism becoming first or second, depending on the source, a branch of their economy right after fishing, they are feeling the pressure of so many people coming to their land, of, of the need to build more and more hotels, of overcrowding of the, all those natural, uh, natural attractions such as geysers, volcanoes, glaciers. So uh, aside of being a great boon for the economies of the Arctic land, of the Arctic areas, the tourism in the Arctic is also bringing things that the inhabitants of the Arctic did not expect, that is overcrowding and, and uh, great changes to their cities, to their societies, and sometimes even to their nature. Aside of these, we can again mention the indigenous peoples who are often quite still uh, doing the traditional economy of their peoples. And the example being uh, reindeer herders in Lapland, in northern Scandinavia. Sami people are still doing that. They are still herding reindeers just as their, their ancestors had. Of course, nowadays they have access to some uh, modern technology that the ancestors did not, such as snowmobiles or electric fences. But nevertheless, it is still being done. Something was wrong, and I forgot to ask you a question because all the people who work there they need to leave something. And now I can ask you a question again. Ask, answer me in the chat. I hope this one will be easier. What do you think? How many people live in the biggest city of the Arctic? Imagine a city in the Arctic and tell me the biggest one. Tell me how many people live there. Let's wait for one or two minutes for the answers, and then I will tell you the truth. Wow, wow, wow. I have seen only one answer, and it is 1,000 people, uh, or many people. Oh, this one actually is closer to truth. Uh, yes, 1,000 people is 
like quite a standard settlement in the Arctic. Let's wait for the slide. Yes, but the biggest city of the Arctic, Murmansk in Russia, uh, is 300 and 300,000 inhabitants. So it is as big as Gdynia in Poland, for example. I don't really have nice um, examples from other countries, but you can Google up Gdynia, how does it look like? And, uh, but uh, it is an exception. The second, other biggest cities are around uh, 100,000, 50,000 50, people, and it isn't many of such big places in the Arctic. Most uh, of uh, kind of Arctic boulders, yeah, I could probably improve on pronunciation. Um, yeah, but back to, to the towns in the Arctic. Um, there aren't many big cities of many thousand people. Most of them are, are just like, like you mentioned, around thousand people, maybe even less. And uh, they don't look like Murmansk. Here you can see a nice uh, panorama of the city, which looks just like usual American or European city. But uh, most of the settlements look like the one in the bottom, like New Ulesund in North Spitbeck. It is a scientific town, so to say, which was um, uh, which was founded as mining settlement, but was converted into scientific site since. And it has 30 inhabitants in the winter and around 130 in summer when scientists come to do their research. And that's usually both the size of the places which rarely go over 1,000 people and as well as their, um, their looks. We have a lot of small houses that are spread over fairly large areas for so little population. And there are very little villages, very few villages, like we like to think of villages, places with agriculture, with fields, with pastures. There isn't many of this because it's very hard to do agriculture in the Arctic. So most often, even though they are small, they look more like towns. And the other thing that has to be mentioned about living in the Arctic, in towns and settlements, is that very often they are really isolated from from the world, so to say. For example, New Orleans, which you can see below, can only be accessed with a plane or with a ship. There is no road, there is no railway. And in the winter, if the fjord was to freeze, we, they'd be only left with planes and helicopters. In Canada, there is a town, Churchill, which does have a railway line and an airport, but it doesn't have a road. So you can only get them by train, or by airplane. In summer, you can reach the place by ships, but the Hudson Bay freezes in winter, so you're only left with the train and the plane in in winters. And it seems like okay situation. I have two ways of getting there, but winters are harsh in the Arctic, very snowy, very windy, very cold. So it is quite common that those places become completely become completely cut off from the world in winter. Even big cities like Reykjavik on Iceland, 120,000 inhabitants, but when a very big blizzard struck the city, sometimes in winters, the government has to shut down roads leading to other places in, on the island because it's too windy just to drive. So that's one thing you, you need to remember about life in the Arctic. It is very isolated. The distances between the cities are also very big, even in relatively densely populated areas such as Norway. And having moved from the life in the Arctic and its economy, we can go to the last part of our class, that is the politics of the Arctic. How does the politics look like in the Arctic? And the most important political institution in the Arctic is the Arctic Council. It is an international organization that uh, an association, so to say, of countries and organizations that are, that are directly involved in the Arctic matters. There are eight, and eight countries who are members of this organization, as well as, as six associations of indigenous peoples. So you can say that the traditional lands of Norway, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Iceland, Finland, USA, Canada, and Russia are represented 
as well as uh, such entities like SAMI Council or the uh, Inuit System Power Conference on the map below. A site of the members who get to vote, to work on the Arctic matters and to um, participate fully in the workings of the Council, there are observers in the Arctic Council. Observers are countries and entities who are interested in what is going on in the Arctic, but they don't get to vote. They are not members, but they can go to the meetings, they can propose solutions, they can uh, look up resolutions, but they are not members and don't get to vote. And who are those observers? For example, Poland is an observer in the Arctic Council. For example, China is an observer in the Arctic Council, which may seem surprising quite far from the Arctic. But I will tell you in a while why China may be interested. Oh, as well as Singapore. We wouldn't really associate Singapore with the Arctic. It's a little city state in a really warm climate, but they still are an observer in the Arctic Council and they are highly interested in what is going on there. And what does the Arctic Council do? Mainly it is um, concerned with international cooperation uh, both on very many different uh, questions, issues such as environmental protection, such as social matters, the life of people in the Arctic, how can it be improved, what sort of resolution, what sort of work should be done for the Arctic people to, to live better lives but as well as international cooperation on the more political level in the matters of, for example, the Arctic Oceans. And for the last slide, I will tell you a little bit about the political tensions that are in the Arctic. We have so many land countries there, and some of them we can think of as, in a way, enemies. Russia and USA, they aren't really supposed to be friends. You know, even if they, especially if they share border. And indeed, there is a, a, an ongoing political dispute over the political sovereignty, sovereignty over the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean, the area in the middle of this little map, you can see, is nowadays the international waters, it's a neutral zone. But Russia is claiming that quite a lot of it, I think including the North Pole, um, should be considered a Russian exclusive economical zone. Why is it so? Of course, there is a lot and a lot of resources, oil and gas, that could be extracted and sold for money. The other countries, especially the USA and Norway, aren't really um, happy with this claim, so they are rather opposing that than supporting such, such an idea of Russian Arctic Ocean. And there are also very big doubts uh, when it comes to the safety of extraction of oil and ice. And on the second photograph, you can see a Greenpeace happening, a Greenpeace action on the same oil rig we have seen before. They have came there, they went there with their ship, they set up an, an transparent future oil disaster zone, which is um, yeah, a statement to, to stop the Arctic drilling, to to stop spoiling this very clean, very natural land with industrial um, development. And that is another one of political conflicts, so to say, in the Arctic, between the organizations and people who would like Arctic to become clean and uh, so, yeah, clean, not industrialized, and the great firms, great corporations that see a lot of resources that can be extracted and, and that could serve humanity as well. And the other uh, political thing that shows up in, in the Arctic, and which is probably the cause why China and Singapore are interested in the Arctic, are the new shipping routes. The map shows one, two of them. The blue one, that's Northwest Passage, and the magenta pink one is the Northeast Passage. And these are the routes that could be used by ships to travel from Asia to Europe, Asia to America, and they are shorter than the currently used routes through Suez Canal, through the Indian Ocean. So it is uh, are quite, um, they are tempting to be used, but they are still, even nowadays, they are still um, 
shipping there, sailing there is quite hard because of ice. And with the warming in the Arctic, with the sea ice receding year by year, it is more and more likely that in the future those routes will be available and could be used year-round to a great saving of costs and oil used to transfer goods from Asia to Europe and the other way around as well. So, um, as you can see, they both lie across coasts of one or two states. So that's another political thing. How would Russia, what would Russia do with their shipping lanes? Would they allow other countries to use it? Would they set up infrastructure, boats, lighthouses, security measures, or will they just block it or put some monopoly on shipping? And the same can be said about Canada. Will they allow people to sail through uh, Canadian islands? Will they allow it to be a uh, international, um, so to say, sea highway, or will they impose large taxes, large fines for using? We don't know. These are the political tensions, the political things that are happening in the Arctic. So this is it for society, economy, and uh, politics of the Arctic. On your handouts, there is a crossword. You can fill it with the answers I have given you today, or you have, you have seen them on the slide as well. And in the gray fields, you will see a word. And this word is a name of a band, a musical band that was founded in the Arctic, that uses some of the Arctic musical heritage in their music. So it is really um, worthwhile to look them up on YouTube once you figure out the name. And if you don't, I will uh, post the name in a few minutes on the chat so every, every one of you can look it up. And for today, thank you for your attention and goodbye.